Today's episode of Design Today is another special one. I get to sit down with a friend of mine. Her name is Katie Chessman. She and her husband have been good friends of both my wife and I now for a couple years. Um, not only is she a creative genius, but she's a, the brains behind a project of her own called the Listening Ear Project. With the Listening Ear Project, she goes in into people's homes and to elderly care facilities, and she interviews the elderly, uh, gathering their stories and their insights from their life and brings them to the forefront so that we can learn a couple things and not lose their stories. It's a really sweet project that you should definitely check out on YouTube and Instagram when you're done listening to the podcast today. Um, but not only is she a creative genius, she's also been very vocal over the last few months about uh, mental health awareness. She's gone through a couple experiences in her own life that has helped her dive into this study. And it's something that spoke to me when I've come across it on social media. As some of you may know, as I've led on to in a couple of podcasts, I too have struggled with balance and anxiety, depression, and a few other things that block creativity. And I know for a lot of creatives, that barrier that we run into is sometimes a hard one to break through. And bringing attention to mental health is something that I feel very passionate about. Katie shares some great insights today, so I don't want to hold this up any longer. Let's get into it. This is another episode of Design Today featuring Katie Chessman. Here we go. Katie, Dylan. thanks for joining the show. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So this happy to be really here. Fun. <laughs> um, Katie is a good friend of mine. Well, I'm going to do all the introductions, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, you've done some really cool stuff with the Listening Air Project. Fact, thanks. this has <laughs> happened where my wife will be going to bed. She she keeps her phone in the bathroom at night, yeah. charges it in there. Smart. And I was laying in bed one night and she's standing in the bathroom with her phone and she's kind of like, she's not like full on sobbing, <laughs> but I can tell there's tears coming down and I'm going, what are you doing? And she was like, this video that Katie did. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll go, it was actually one of the more recent ones you've done. Yeah. And I was like, oh, come on, bring it over. Let me see it. And then we start watching it together. I'm like, I'm not crying. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not crying. You're crying. I'm not crying. <laughs> oh, my God. You've done some really cool stuff. Um, I want you to introduce yourself. I want you to talk a little bit about this passion project of yours called the Listening Ear Project. Uh, go ahead and plug it to your heart's content. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about that. All right. So I started the Listening Ear Project probably three years ago. Well, I'll back up a little bit. So I'm a nurse and I worked in home health in the geriatric field. I just love old people i forgot I that have. that's how this started yeah yeah okay keep going so as a nurse i would just talk with my patients and mm -hmm. they tell me all these crazy stories and i just noticed when i like stopped to listen to them because when you're a nurse you're just like running all over when sure. i would stop and like listen to them i sure. would just see a change in them and i was like this is rad and then all these stories i'm like i need to share this so one day i just started filming like some of my patients and then i ended up quitting and just staying home with my babies and then I just kind of continued because it was my favorite aspect of mm -hmm. my job was like the patient care, not so much like the actual nursing. Yeah. And so, um, well, let me talk about what I actually do. Yeah, um, the Listening Ear Project. <laughs> so the Listening Ear Project, um, I basically interview senior citizens and I share their wisdom and stories online. I film them, edit them down and then share my favorite bits and pieces of their interviews. So. And it's, I just hope to like inspire people and kind of be an advocate for the elderly. I feel like they're a little um, brushed under the rug in our society. And mm -hmm. I just want to bring to light like how much wisdom they have and mm -hmm. uh, how much we should appreciate their wisdom. So, sure. Yeah. What are some of the cool experiences you've had doing that? Oh my gosh. I just feel like I've learned so much. Yeah. Uh, I've had history lessons about the Korean War, World War II, the Great uh -huh. Depression, you know, when you're not paying attention in uh -huh. high school and you're like, oh, this is actually really important. And then to hear <laughs> from people who actually lived during those times sure. is like mind blowing. And um, and then advice, you know, just about motherhood and things that apply to my life that still apply to my life, you know, even though they experienced it so long ago. I just I just have learned so much and I've grown close to these people and it's just amazing that um, they can be so vulnerable with me and talk about these like rough things they've been through. And um, why are they so cool with that? We struggle to be that open. Yeah, why are, why I, are they more open to it? I think it's their age. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
because as a generation, they they are pretty private and uh -huh. they are a little paranoid. They don't want their information out right. there and all that. But I think when you get to a certain age, um, and they're very like matter of fact, like yep. they're like uh, my son passed away when he was three. You know, they aren't as emotional. Like it's very factual. But um, I think also just when you get to that age, uh, you realize that your experiences and what you've been through can help yep. people. And so I think they are a little more open about sharing stuff later on in life. Yeah. You know, the, the video I was telling you about with uh, Jane watching in the bathroom was actually with our neighbors, oh, the rugs. Yeah. That is like the timeliness of all that. Okay, here we go. We're gonna get choked up. Yeah. The timeliness of all that. Uh, talk a little bit about that project. Yeah. Because I think that one really demonstrates well why you're doing all this. Yes, absolutely. Um, So we have some neighbors. Um. Reese and Cheryl Rugg, they're the cutest couple uh, from Louisiana, so yep. they have these accents. Yep. And um, Cheryl was diagnosed with a super rare form of cancer, and she uh, she had, the doctor told her she would only live, you know, a couple months. Yep. And then she ended up living eight, nine months. She stopped treatments and was just suffering. And in the back of my mind, <clears throat> I kept thinking, like, oh, you got to get over to the rugs. you got to get over to the rugs. Right. And I... I just kind of kept pushing it back, pushing it back. And I felt a little bit awkward because I didn't know them very well. A um, couple months later, I get called in my church to like basically be over them and watch okay. and care for them, bring them yep. meals and organize all that. And so I was able to get to know them and it just, it worked out perfectly. I, I filmed a video of them. I, cause I went over and visited with them and got to know them and she was bedridden at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very sick. Very weak. Um, she was still cognitive, though. And the love that they had for each mm -hmm. other, I was just like, I got to share this. Like, I this is say. like true, pure love. Like watching Reese, like care for her and yeah. get her dressed. And I'm like, I need to document this. And especially for their family, you know, knowing yeah. that she only had a few weeks left to live and then filmed it, edited it and, you know, sent it off to the family. And couple weeks later she ended up passing away yeah. and just that they could have that documentation uh was so they were just so grateful and the insights that they shared about love and being there for each other like all that kind of stuff yeah. is i mean here's a couple who's been put through the ringer yes and yeah they've learned through trial and they've yeah uh, you could just see the love that he had for her mm -hmm. uh sitting by her side through all of it i mean it was incredible yeah thank you it's thank a cool you. that was like that was like like you said, like, this is why I do it. Yep. You know, that was like the one video that I was like, this is the most important video I've ever made. Yep. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's cool. That's, uh, and what an experience that uh, now the family gets to hang on to that because she did pass away shortly after that. Yeah, that was cool. Um, you have been my go to uh, <laughs> when it comes to mental health and you've been very uh vulnerable yourself through the things that you posted on social media. You've been very transparent with uh, what you've gone through as far as mental health goes. Um, so that's really what I wanted to talk to is you've got such a, a great passion project that you're doing, but I know that there is this hindrance that can come in, which is mental health. And I want you to describe a little bit about what that uh, hindrance has been to you. Uh, and that's kind of, we'll start, we'll go from there. Okay. So, like I said, I started this project three years ago mm -hmm. and it's kind of ebbed and flowed. You know, I've kind of just like gone with it naturally. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm super passionate about it. Not, I'm always passionate, but super motivated yep. to do things. You know, I, I don't get paid at this point. So yep. and I I take time away from my family to do this. Yep. But I know this is kind of what I'm called to do. And like I really enjoy it. So it's kind of been like this. And then um, I had a baby. He's eight months old now. And at about four months after uh, I had him, I I was just like, man, I'm not feeling like myself. And I didn't think it was postpartum depression because I, it was so late, first of all. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have it with my first baby. And so I was like, oh, I'm in the clear. Like, I'm good. I just, but I was just off. And then uh, just. What did you think it was? I just thought that it was my hormones, maybe. Like, I'm like, uh, Still they just out need the to level thing. it sure. out. You know, sure. they need to level out. And then <laughs> and then I just started sobbing out of nowhere for no reason. I'm like, all right, I need to get <laughs> checked out. So um, and then it was during that time period. I, you know, I 
I sought out help. I got on some medication. And during that time period of getting on medication and waiting for it to kick in, which is usually about two to four weeks, it was the darkest time of my life. I just have never experienced anything like that before. I, all I could do was like live and like Mm -hmm. care for myself. Uh, luckily my husband was home at that time. He, He was like in between jobs, thankfully. And I remember just like being out on the lawn, just like laying for hours. Cause that was like all I could do to, mm. and I, I mean, I couldn't eat, I could barely shower and get ready. Um, and so obviously I wasn't working on my project during that time, Yeah, you know, like You're not recording during all that. <laughs> I'm not serving people in interviewing. And, <laughs> um, so yeah, it was rough. And then the medication started kicking in and, um, I was becoming, you know, a little more stable mentally. I wasn't having those dark, dark thoughts, but, uh, it was still like, I, like during this time, don't focus on anything, like focus on taking care of yourself, you know? And that was really hard for me because I'm such a go, go, go person. I'm like project, get it done. And Mm -hmm. I'm used to like being around people and serving people. And it was really hard to shift my mindset and be like, you need to serve yourself. Like you need to focus on yourself right now. So what'd you learn in that process? I mean, you Um, mentioned it's hard. Yeah. I, I actually gained a lot of, um, perspective on like, just loving myself and appreciating myself and like being kind to myself and prioritizing my mental health and like self-care because you are so used, especially as a mother, you're so used to give, 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 give to all those around you. And as a creative, like you're like, you have so much passion that you just want to put it into these projects and, you know, help other people and inspire other people. But it made me like stop, like literally made me stop and focus on me and care for me and um I'm like back on you know back to my old self and having more motivation but I, I've still I'm still prioritizing that self-care and it's like now a part of my daily routine mm-hmm. um but now that I'm like kind of back and more motivated it's just helped me realize like as creatives and um just as artists it's always going to be up and down and yeah. I think you just need to ride the waves yeah even though it sucks, like <clears throat> not being able to like put your passion into something or like even not be feeling inspired. Like I'll have like a couple of weeks where I'm just like, I'm not feeling it. And before I used to like kind of freak out and be like, I need to be working and yeah. be doing this. And, I, and now I'm kind of like, you know what? The inspiration is going to flow naturally and come naturally. So I need to take this time to just chill, care for myself, you know, spend time with my family and do things that I love. And then then the inspiration will come back and I'll have that push of motivation, you know? And are you good with the fact then that you're maybe you're not putting out as much content or maybe you're not like, how do you balance that? It's hard, but honestly, like if you're worried about like gaining a following and things like that, I, I didn't like lose that much by taking a break. You know, it's not like, I think we worry about it more than like, other people do obviously like people aren't sitting there like oh i haven't seen a post from them in like a while you know and we're so like i didn't post three times a week no 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 but like people literally don't notice and they're not going to unfollow you if you don't post for a couple weeks and in fact if i've ever opened up about it like i did post a couple things on my listening ear page about like hey i'm taking a little break taking care of myself like more people followed and more people stayed because they respected me for that decision. So I'm glad you said that. We actually just said that in a previous podcast where I mentioned the fact that I hadn't posted anything in July. Yeah. And he was, uh, I was interviewing Cody and he was like, well, how do you deal with that? I mean, that's not very consistent. I was like, I don't think people care about me as much as I think they care about me. Yes. Or at least as much as I used to think that they care about me. And at this point in time, if I don't show up in their feed for a month, they don't know. Yeah. They don't notice. Next time I post them, they'll be like, oh, hey, check that out. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, we were talking about that with a friend. Just how even like how much effort you put into a caption or something. Mm-hmm. And you're like, could spend hours trying to think of something so creative. And people yeah. are like, nee, nee, nee. Yep. <laughs> like no one right really it. cares. So, yeah, that's a good point. Let me rewind a bit mm-hmm. um, because you, you jumped in from recognizing where you're at at, at four months after uh, having Bo. Uh, to getting on medication, but that period of time in between those, those moments, Mm. when did you know this was time for me to get in coping? I don't know if coping is the right word, but 
recognizing that maybe this is something more than just mm -hmm. I need to go work out today and that will solve everything. Or maybe if I meditate, that will solve everything. Yeah. Uh, what do you do in that window? Well, I think what's hard about mental health is it's really hard to see it, mm -hmm. but it's much easier to see in other people. Mm -hmm. You know, I have people in my life where I'm like, oh man, they are so anxious. Like mm -hmm. they're so depressed, severely depressed, it, you know? And so it's hard to see. And even for myself, it was hard to see. And I was even watching, like, I was like, I'm going to look out for symptoms, you know? Um, I think, I think what the big thing for me was, um, like I mentioned, I'm a go, go, go person and right. like had motivation. I had no motivation to do anything. I was just, I felt like I was like numb, just like going through the motions and, um, my responses like to my husband and just my relationships I was so apathetic didn't care or I was like I would snap and like be angry and emotional and I just I just wasn't myself and um it wasn't until like I started being like very emotional you know that I was like okay my hormones are definitely like something is off um but d did you jump then at that point in time saying this is postpartum at that point, yeah. You um, did at that point. I mean, it, it took like a solid month of like not feeling like myself. And then mm -hmm. I was talking to a few friends and like a couple of them said, oh, I got postpartum like four or five months after I had my baby. And I was like, oh, like all of a sudden it was like light bulb. That like, could be. That could be it, mm -hmm. you know. And then and then when I started having like kind of tanking, I was like, yeah, this is definitely it. Yep. And it's, it's not something you, you can even fathom unless you go through it. Like, yep. like you hear about people being depressed and you're kind of like, oh, come on, get off the couch, go yep. on a walk. Like, yep. but when you're in that dark place and like in that hole, you can't like you can't do those things. Yep. And so I, I'm very much like I love the holistic approach. Um, I also love modern medicine. I'm, I'm a nurse, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I do love trying things that you can do on your own before seeking medical attention. But when you're that low, like you need something, there's a chemical imbalance in your brain. And that's when I decided to get on medication. It was like, then when I was like somewhat more stable, then I could start applying like, you know, exercising and yeah. taking care of myself, yep. meditating, all those things. Um, but it's easier said than done to be like, you know. Well, and I think just uh, speaking for myself, I mean, do you watch The Office? Yeah. Okay, so we just actually watched this episode just last night, I think, where they've got uh, Andy and Dwight, and they're interviewing uh, Toby. Oh, yeah. And then they're trying to figure out the group to go down to Tallahassee or whatever to, for this Florida group. Yeah. And they're like, Toby's like, I need to get out of here because these long winters have been really rough. And Dwight's like, oh, are you sad? <laughs> Do you have seasonal effectiveness disorder? And he was like, yes, thank you for acknowledging it. <laughs> and you can tell that they're totally mocking him. Yeah. I yeah. remember the first time hearing about seasonal effectiveness disorder, thinking the same thing. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, the know. sky is gray. Yeah, I'm poor sorry. You. Yeah. yeah. Life is so hard. <laughs> and then it was a couple years ago where I did feel down and i don't know if it's seasonal effectiveness disorder or if it was just not taking care of myself but i remember first time going like could i fit into that category of somebody yeah. who's mentally struggling based on anxieties and stresses and all these different things and mm -hmm. at first i was like no i've got like superhuman <laughs> genes that's not me yeah like i don't have those weaknesses yes. and so it took a long time for me to go this is something i it took a long time for me to realize that this is something I need help with. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that I was like, no, you can battle through this because you are someone who battles and you're right. someone who's strong and you'll figure out your life adjustments you need to make and mm -hmm. you'll fix this and you'll get through it. Yeah. And I remember going to the gym and I remember finding these meditation apps and I remember carrying around my little notebook where I keep track of all my thoughts to help get stuff off my mind. Uh, that I was starting to do these things and it was feeling better, but I wasn't fixed. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel normal. I didn't feel right my, uh, to myself. Yeah. And that's where I kept going like, oh my goodness, what does this mean? Am yeah. I somebody who's going to have anxiety? Mm -hmm. I don't even know what that means. Like I've never yeah. even opened up. Like, do I have like social anxieties? Do I have 
uh, stress that's turning me gray. Like all these types of things where I'm going, I'm not a perfect human. Yeah. I have imperfections. And now all of a sudden this is going to be part of my life. It took a long point, a long time to accept that that was part of my adult life now. Absolutely. And I mean, isn't that for everyone? That's why we have stigmas and you know, Mm -hmm. it's hard to admit like there's a problem. That Mm -hmm. is the hardest part of this is saying like, I need help. And even me, I'm a nurse. I'm like, here, take this, take this, take (laughs) this. And I'm like, wait, I have to take something Mm -hmm. like, no, I don't need it. Like I'm fine. I can do this on my own. Um, but kind of just swallowing that pride. And if, if you think about it, the reason why I've been so open about it is because when I started opening up, you know, about you know, to my neighbors and friends, almost every single one Everyone of them felt the same, had gone through that. Yep. And I'm like, why aren't we talking about this? Can't We're all going this. through the exact same thing. Yep. Why not be open and help yep. each other? And that's what's so silly about being ashamed of something like this is because we're the majority of people are going through it. And we've got to throw up these facades to make sure that we look like we're living the, our best lives all the time. Mm-hmm. But the truth of it is that a lot of people are, are facing these types of things. They're, yeah. they're going through these things, like you mentioned. You know, one of the harder parts for me was uh, when it came to even the medication. Mm-hmm. I was going, I don't need medication because I'm not a person who's going to wake up and take a pill every day. Yeah. That's yeah. not me. That means that I am weak and I am mm-hmm. flawed and uh, that's not me yeah i'm better than that Mm -hmm. learning to accept that's rough yeah it's hard and uh one of the things that helped me a lot um i kind of went to a a mentor (laughs) she's one of my good friends but she's had depression her Mm -hmm. entire life like severe depression and i was talking to her about it about the medication thing and it's just i mean back to the stigma she's like if you had something going on with your leg you would go to the doctor. Yep. Why do we treat our brains differently? Like they're the biggest organ in our body. Is that mm-hmm. right? I'm like, yeah, I'm right. a nurse and I feel like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're the just, most important. There's a disclaimer at the bottom of the YouTube yes. video that says it is not the biggest organ in your body. I have no <laughs> do idea. Do not trust her <laughs> with your health. The most important. Sure. I believe. Argue it. I you know, care. like without our mental health. Yep what are we so um yeah i think just not treating it any different than any other health issue you would have let's talk about your husband for a second okay your husband kevin he's actually one of my best friends so i, I was gonna bash him then i was like <laughs> no nobody's gonna know that he's a friend of mine so they're gonna think i'm a jerk so i'm not gonna bash. <laughs> kevin's a good guy yeah how was what is, was his role as you went through all this, because I know some people might be listening going like, okay, that's not really applicable to me, but mm-hmm. my significant other, mm. I can see this. Yeah. What, yeah, what advice or what, mm-hmm. what was Kevin doing right? What was Kevin doing wrong? <laughs> yeah. Maybe he didn't do anything wrong, but what did you learn in that process? Of, how did you depend on him? Okay. So when I first was like, I think I might have postpartum, he was kind of like a little skeptical. Cause I do tend to be a little bit of a hypochondriac and I'm like, <laughs> you know, anxiety, obviously Uh like, Oh, something's wrong with me. Um, but then he started, I think he started talking to friends whose wives had experienced it. And then he was like, and then I was laying on the lawn all day long and he was like, okay, (laughs) she's, she's got something going on. Um, and he was just really supportive. And that is like the number one thing you have to have a support network. I've talked, had girls come to me saying like, my family doesn't believe me. They think I'm like making this up for attention. Right. You have to find your people and you have to find people who are supportive, who are willing to listen, who are willing to check in. You know, I had so many people check in on me. And for me personally, it was really healing to talk about it and to explain how I was feeling that day or that hour. So having people reach out to me was huge. Um, And then my husband just taking over with the kids. Like I said, I wasn't able to. (laughs) And that's not always a possibility. I understand that. But just if you're a spouse, like helping wherever you can and then just being a sounding board and validating them, you know, in that moment, you feel crazy. Validation. You feel like I can't even describe it. But having someone be like, man, that would suck. Like, I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. It's just like, OK, I'm not making this up. This is a real thing. 
Uh, so validation is really important. You know, one of the things that Jane always gets asked for me about is that when she tries to express some of these feelings, she just wants validation, and I'm always immediately jumping for the solution. Yes. Maybe I feel that's, like that's a husband thing, too. It like, might be. Just, like, fix and the problem. It, honestly, it comes out of a good place because I'm just like, I don't want you to struggle. Let yeah, me fix this. Totally. I want to fix this for you. But oftentimes she's like, I don't want you to fix this. I just want you to hear this. Yes. And that's, I think, what you're kind of talking about here is the need to not be judged, mm -hmm. uh, to be heard, to be validated, to be supported. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's an important role to be able to have, even if it's not your husband or your significant other, just be able to have that support system. Well, that's definitely it. The other thing I was going to add is I think one of the things that's allowed me to be more vocal about what I've gone through is seeing other people be vocal about what they're going through. You know, watching some of the things that you post on social media about what you were going through is made me realize that it's okay that I'm going through this. Mm -hmm. It's okay that I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. Uh, others are feeling it too. And that's, I mean, that's part of the reason I wanted to get you on here and to talk about this because I know without a doubt that even if there is three people listening to this, mm -hmm. one of them feels that way. Yeah, totally. So the exposure to it, the, the communication around it, I do think it's super important, specifically as creatives. Again, this is, um, it's like a damning piece, right? It's, mm -hmm. It blocks any sort of creativity. Yeah. And it's important to take care of. So what other bits of, uh, uh, I don't know, expertise or uh, what techniques have you used to um, to work through some of these things, these roadblocks? Therapy has been huge for me. Uh, I did a little bit of therapy in high school, um, but not much. Um, that's been really helpful to me. And I know that not everyone can afford it. Some insurance sure. cover it, some don't. But I would say medication, therapy, and a support network. Those are like my three go-tos. Um, as far as like little things here and there, mm -hmm. daily walks just to clear your mind and like leave With the, the distraction. No, <laughs> that's another thing my husband does. He yeah. lets me go on my walks. Yeah. And like two years ago, I would have been like, what? A walk by myself? That's crazy. I have to care for people. But now I'm like going on my walk. And oftentimes what's interesting is that's when the inspiration comes. You know, I leave my phone at home. And that's when like, mm. like ideas will Clearing your flow mind. Yeah. yeah meditation um just taking time for you doing things you love i've yep. been like into hiking this summer and that's been so fun and just like play play like you did when you were a kid find yeah. what you like we've been playing pickleball i'm like i've never played pickleball in my life but it's so fun uh -huh. um yeah just like go back to your roots and find what makes you happy and um so for someone who's a creative, who feels stumped, blocked, uh, been putting some thought into this for themselves, what last piece of advice do you have for them? Um, yeah, who's struggling and doesn't know what to do next? I think my advice would be, I think you're just overthinking it, which I tend to do too. And like I said, if you just back off and like, don't think so hard just enjoy your life and find the things you love and take the time to have that mental clarity then it'll come like I mean it, that's my experience you know so I think just try not to force it so much and just take a step back and kind of let it come to you mm -hmm. and as far as finding that support network identifying those close around you what what advice do you have there um I think you know you know, like, you know, the people who believe you and support you and validate you, um, just hang on to those people, uh, the people who are willing to listen yeah, and admit, you know, that, yeah, this is a problem. Uh, I think generationally, my parents have been great, but I think a lot of, um, older generations are like depression. <laughs> Sure. Even people I've interviewed, oh, I've yeah. opened up to, you know, older friends oh, and yeah. they're like, postpartum, that wasn't a thing. And I'm like, it was, but mm -hmm. you just didn't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. um, so just finding the people who who support and love you and who are reaching out. You know, it's so funny you said that. I remember as I started to go through some of these things about a year ago, I was having lunch with my dad and he was like, what do you mean you have social anxieties? <laughs> and I was like, well, it's I think it's for me, this is what it means. And he was like, huh, interesting. Do you think I have that? I was like, dad, 
whenever you've got more than six people at the house, you disappear for an hour. Mm -hmm. And he was like, is that anxiety? <laughs> I was like, well, there's a reason why you always put down towels on the chairs before my kids sit down. I think you exp you have a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> here. And he was like, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. I've got anxiety. And he was like so <laughs> proud of this like new realization. found realization that he had. Yeah. Uh, but I think, like we said, it is more common than uh, than we think. But another, uh, uh, I don't know, idea that I've heard a lot about recently and, and in different settings too, uh, is reevaluating your personal circles. Uh, because I think a lot of times you, in that evaluation of who's in close proximity, yeah, there may be a lot of anxiety coming from specific individuals totally, or stress coming from specific individuals. I mean, mm -hmm. as sad as it is, it could be your parents. Yeah. It could be the pressure that you're feeling from mm -hmm. a significant other. I mean, yeah. you're not going to go abandon them, but right talking about these things and expressing mm -hmm. those things because a lot of it may not just be in your head as much as it is in the environment that you're in totally and you got to like make create that space right you got to back off if you are in like some sort of toxic relationship mm -hmm. and um just surround yourself with people who are you are going to like uplift yeah. and inspire you and like make you want to be your the best version of yeah. you yeah so. well i appreciate your time coming on you've you shared a lot of great insight and I appreciate you sharing your story because a lot of people are going to relate to that. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And if you haven't already, everyone listening, you need to check out the listening your project. Where can they find it? Um, so on Facebook and Instagram, it's just at the listening your project and I'm working on website stuff in the future. So cool. that should be there. Is it all on YouTube as well? No, it's not on YouTube right your now. Your videos aren't on YouTube? No, they're just on Vimeo right oh, that's now. That's fine. But... That's fair enough. Yeah. I cool. should get them on there, though. So they're on Vimeo as well. Yep. Okay. Well, if you're listening, check out Katie. Check out her projects. They're definitely worth grabbing a tissue box and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, learning a few things from the people who have come before us. Thank you. Thanks again, Katie. Yep.